<laughs> Good morning, beautiful people. <clears throat> Good morning, Babs. Good morning, Jeff Grant. How you doing? I'm all right. If y'all just tuned in, you've got Criminal Justice Insider with uh, Babs Rose Ivy and Jeff Grant. That's true. <laughs> Sponsored by the Community Foundation of Greater New Haven. Now more than ever. Yay! All right. <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year. This is our second show of the new year, so we still got a lot of energy. Oh, yeah. We have a guest who drove uh, like 100 hours to get here. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Took a ferry and everything. I, I love our guests because they come from all points beyond, <clears throat> and they come with such uh, enthusiasm, and so that makes us very happy. So uh, so before we introduce our guests, before we introduce Serena Ligori, uh, Jeff and I are going to talk a little bit about what's going on in each of our um, criminal justice lives. So shout out to Lynn Springer. And Andrew Kaplan. How you doing out there? Hope you're listening in. Oh, Andrew won't be listening in. No, well, Andrew's on his way to sunnier shores. Guatemala. Guatemala. <laughs> Guatemala. Well, he will immerse himself in all things Spanish. Yeah. So No criminal justice insider in Guatemala. Unless we do a remote yeah, podcast. A remote would be great. <laughs> Speaking of remotes, I, I heard a rumor that we might be doing a remote in two three months yes not yeah. a rumor it's yeah. it's a done deal isn't it's, it it's a, yeah it's a done deal but i don't think we're ready to quite announce oh, okay. it yet we won't but, say it yet. but uh this that... begins our tour oh yeah sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is our world tour <laughs> yeah. but we will have an exciting announcement coming up we're going to be live on stage yes yes but, jeff but... and i are taking this gig on the road <clears throat> but we are not ready to announce quite yet so but... you and jackie and uh you and you and jackie Polveri, uh Polverari, Ferrari are uh, speaking at uh, Albertus Magnus College in March. Yeah, they have a justice forum, a justice panel that they do every year, and they've invited the two of us to speak on March 23rd. That'd be nice. Really nice. And um, it's going to be twice, one for the day students, one for the night students. The public is invited. Uh, I have no idea what I'm going to do for the four hours in between, but we'll figure that out. Yeah. And so that's on March 23rd at Albertus Magnus, and uh, we'll be making, uh, as the reservation uh, link comes up, we'll, we'll put it out there. And you're speaking at Michigan State in May. And there's a white collar conference on I May know there was such a thing. There is. And a bunch... <laughs> I'm a pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's not a how-to guide. Oh, not no, how-to? No, oh. no, 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 no. I thought I was going to sharpen my skills. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> But it'll have academics and um, it'll have formerly incarcerated people and um, people from all uh, different parts of the ecosystem put on by our friend Jay Kennedy out there. Okay. And uh, I am very grateful that they're flying me out and we're going to be able to speak nice. at that. And we have people from all over the country on our support group who are... I'm me looking forward to the pictures. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause I know you're gonna put I know, some, I know you. Going. I know you're gonna put the pictures up, Jeff. Cause you are a social oh, media as, as queen. We, we, the pictures will be up as as we speak. I know. I as can't wait speak. to see him. Yep. I can't wait to see him. Yep. So, uh, uh, Serena Ligori is our guest. Oh wait, wait. Oh no, we got one more thing. The, the Connecticut uh, Hall of Change inaugural ceremony is uh, Thursday, April 9th. and they are taking nominees nominations uh, because they are creating awards for people who do criminal justice work. Yeah, or yeah, I I think everyone who, who have come out of prison and right and have changed their lives around. But you had I, to have been out of prison for a particular amount of time. I think it's five five years. years. I think, but this is a really groundbreaking initiative um, put um, put together by our friend Charlie Grady. Yes, who was here not too long ago, and uh, an amazing amount of support by the state and um, nonprofits and business. And the award ceremony will be in Hartford mm -hmm. on, you have the date, I'm sorry. April 9th. April 9th. Mm -hmm. And um, so I am talking to Charlie right after this this broadcast. Yes. So if you're listening live, I'm speaking to him um, next. And, uh, you know, we'll see if it's another opportunity to get them on or do a remote. Oh, that would be whatever. nice. That would oh, yeah. be nice. That would be nice. Oh, yeah. So I'm, they're I'm, taking nomina nominations on their website. Um, hang time in real time. No, hangtimerealtalk.com. Hangtimerealtalk.com. And you get click through to yes. their uh, So if you survey. if you know any criminal justice folks that you really want to nominate for an award who are doing this hard work out here raising awareness around criminal justice. Yeah. Feel free. <laughs> ba ba Babs, I, 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 I feel free would, to nominate. Yeah, yeah, Bab yeah Babs, I, I, I would never go so far as to ask our listeners to nominate you. 
Okay, that's a that's some. Nor I you, <laughs> no, Jeff. Exactly, I understand. <laughs> but just in case, that's Babs Rawls Ivy <laughs> and Jeff Grant. <laughs> Shameless. Shameless. All right. So our guest today is uh, Serena Liguori, Executive Director for New Hour for Women and Children, um, Long Island. Um, she is responsible for all aspects of New Hour's operations, fundraising, and uh, administration. Serena is formerly incarcerated. She, she is a formerly incarcerated Latina and 18-year prisoner rights advocate. She is also responsible for nurturing partnerships with organizations and funders focused on social justice and legislative ad advocacy. She's also responsible for creating ways in which New Hour remains at the forefront of social justice initiatives locally and throughout New York State. And prior to joining the New Hour staff, she was the executive director of Her Story Writers Workshop, a nonprofit dedicated to providing writing workshops to underser underserved populations. Oh, she's, she's one of your folks, Bob. Yes. She's a writer. I, uh, you know, got to love the All writer. Right. Are you still doing that work? Uh, I still coordinate very regularly with them, and I am still writing. Oh, good. <laughs> so let me finish, because this is such yep. good good work yep, here. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. She also serves as the uh, prison, she also serves as Associate Director of Policy at the Correctional Association of New York's Women in Prison Project. Um, where she spearheaded legislative initiatives and policy advocacy addressing prison reform. She was a key organizer of a successful effort to create the Adoption and Safe Families Act expanded uh, discretion law, which works to secure parental rights for incarcerated parents, as well as anti-shackling law, Re uh, recently the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, which allows survivor defendants to be, sen to be sentenced more fairly. She earned her associate's degree at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility College Bound Program and holds a BA in liberal arts from Adelphi University. Serena enjoys cooking her favorite traditional Puerto Rican meals for her family. Welcome. Yes, thank Hola. you. Hola. Wow. Hola. Wow. <laughs> so uh, how long did you serve in Bedford Hills? So I was at Bedford uh, at age 19 for three years. So mm -hmm. I came home at 21. Interestingly, I had a birthday cake that some of my sisters behind bars made, and even one of the officers sang "Happy Twenty First Birthday" in wow. prison. So, wow! Yeah. That's no, got in, to in be... the microwave, right? And no, we had a little hot pot that they made. <laughs> that, you know, we we did a lot. We used the top of cans oh, to cut Lord. up. You know, we're going that back now. That prison life, boy. <laughs> <laughs> the creativity that flows up out of there. Yeah, you, don't, you don't look like an OG. <laughs> ah, an OG. That you know, we were in Albany just this Tuesday advocating for the aging population and I ran into two of the women who uh, worked on you know banning shackling of pregnant women and we said we're the OG we've been doing this a really long time <laughs> <laughs> Connecticut just uh, we just um, passed our laws in the last le legislative session to stop shackling pregnant women Excellent. which which when I think about that I'm just blown away and baffled by why that is a thing why did anybody think that that was like, where are you going to go as a woman where who are just giving birth or in the process of giving birth? You're yeah. not going to run. And and that's the interesting thing. Back in 2009, when we were working on this bill, uh, then New York State Governor Patterson, you know, we went back and forth where they were weighing whether this would be good or bad. And some somebody at some point said, if you're in labor, if you've ever been in labor, you are not leaving, running, walking anywhere. So it's just not feasible. Yes. And uh, but really, it is a form of barbaric torture. And I think especially for women who are incarcerated, we survive so much. Um, and uh, there's sexual assault, there's abuse, there's trauma, there's layers and layers that, you know, the criminal justice system perpetuates. And I think it's in increasingly important to talk about it as it relates to women, because it's certainly uh, we're the largest growing population of prisoners. Yes. As, as the men are uh, slowly, thankfully, the, 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 the rates are dropping, there's a rise mm -hmm. in women being incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably directly in correlation to drugs and, and, uh, and, and contraband and stuff like that. Because it, women oftentimes are the mules and... And there's a, the there's, hiders of boyfriends and yes, that kind of thing. The, there's a lot of coercion. Uh, and that's really when we were talking about the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, 
the kind of work behind that law now is that uh, judges can take into consideration if somebody is a survivor of abuse and may have been coerced into a crime because of that abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and it's what we see in the local jail. We work with about a thousand women a year and nine out of 10 are survivors of serious abuse and often say if they were engaged. Um, we also believe in accountability and responsibility for your actions, but we recognize that women's pathways are often the criminalization of mental illness, the criminalization. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's 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 much more layered and complex than people like mm -hmm. to to think, as we know. Mm -hmm. you, you know what they say in the 12 step rooms that men come into the program beat up by life and women come into the program beat up by men. I would agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that, that I mean, would make sense. Not always, but mm -hmm. I would say that uh, pain perpetuates pain. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that, you know, for women who go through our leadership program, our eMERGE program, many of the women say, if I had had a program like this when I was 17 versus now at 30, I would not have recidivated. I would not have gone back to using drugs to cover up uh, pain and and all of the things mm -hmm. that you know folks rely on substances for mm -hmm. so when you come out of prison at 21 what do you know nothing <laughs> <laughs> you, and how did you know how, like what was the, what was the pathway to get you here yes so i love this question because at 21 i i had already lived a whole existence of trauma and pain and yeah. felt really old but the truth is i knew absolutely nothing and was really vulnerable to mm -hmm. um, choosing unhealthy relationships, um, being on my own. Uh, one of the things I did was I got a job. I rode my bike uh, to a coffee place and started working. And my parole officer, uh, God bless their soul, uh, would intimidate by showing up on the line. So you couldn't, the, the, um, the coffee shop was so busy that you really didn't look up and all of a sudden, there would be their their face standing there. And mm. I would think, are you here to rearrest me? What am I doing wrong? Mm. So the level of intimidation that somebody who comes home from prison at such a young age, it's incredible. I didn't know what to ask for. I didn't know I deserved counseling or deserved to have support. And unfortunately, um, I still see women coming home. I have a 20-year-old who's interning in our office and it's like a flashback because she just embodies everything I was some 21 years ago. <laughs> was, it, was it hard for you to get the job at the coffee shop? Yes, um, it, it was hard. Interestingly, I had somebody who decided to hire me who had a history of substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And so they understood uh, not why I, you know, not everything about why I was there and, you know, my family and mental illness that that uh, coerced me into uh, being part of an unfortunate tragedy. But they understood that people deserve second chances. Mm -hmm. And so for that, I'm, I'm really thankful. OK, so you come out of 21. What's your what, what do you do? Well, I you uh, go back home with people, with your family. No, Are you welcome there. What, what? I I. Um, I had a, 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 a mending relationship with my father, uh, and so it wasn't a space where I was going back to. And uh, interestingly, I had made friends with a woman who was um, a wonderful volunteer in the jail, and we stayed in touch for the three years I was gone, mm. and she offered me a place to stay in her home. Wow. wow. Until I went back to college. Mm -hmm. And um, she's since passed, uh, but she was just a very unique and wonderful person. Without that, I would have been in a shelter. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have um, the the support or the planning. You know, when you're up in Bedford, you you might as well be on Mars. You're not connected to <laughs> oh, anyone or, any, or anything. Or any prison, yeah, for that any matter. Yeah, any prison, any prison. But, but they did have um, college courses, right? They did have college courses, and that was my saving grace. You stepped into that college room, and you were no longer a prisoner. You were a student. Mm -hmm. And that change and shift in identity every night, you know, when you got on that program line at 6.30 or whatever, and you went off, and the, the professors treated you like a student, it was my lifeline mm -hmm. to uh, my self-image because so much of my image, self self-esteem, had been destroyed mm -hmm. by by what had what had happened. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly, you know, 
I was talking with a friend of mine. She says, oh, well, do you know what everybody in Bedford did? And I said, no, we, us women, we never talked about our crimes. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, you're right. We, we never talked about, and part of me feels like I almost wish we had, because we would have realized we had so much in common. Mm -hmm. Almost all of us were survivors of abuse, mm -hmm. um, survivors of all kinds of uh, family violence. Mm -hmm. And we could have really leaned on each other. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't think that, you know what? I was the attend, you know, I was where I was in Danbury 10, 20, almost 15 years ago. They don't encourage that kind of sharing. Like, I think that's a good idea if somebody could come in and help facilitate, facilitate. those kinds of conversations amongst women to share so that you do see the similarities um, in everybody's humanity, right? In yes. everybody's story. Yes, exactly. And I think there's, there's a code of honor, right? Which is, you know, I don't ask you, you don't ask me. Mm -hmm. Let's just be here and be, you know, nice to each other and support each other. But there is a level missing when you're not able to really see how you identify mm -hmm. with any other woman you're incarcerated with. Mm -hmm. And so it took years later. And now, you know, I was in Albany reunited with some of the women who I had spent years with and who then spent decades there. Mm -hmm. And um, we came back together and said, wow, we've all, we are all such amazing survivors. And we weren't able to acknowledge that then, you know, because nobody was talking about it. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your advocacy work. So, because I think that's, I think, you know, we can, we can be on the boots on the ground, but if nobody is talking to the legislative bodies about how to change some of this, um, then we're still stuck at ground zero. Yes. And I think, for a long time when I came home, probably till I was about 25 or 26, I said, you know, I'm going to put this behind me. I'm going to pretend this never happened. That um, kind of identity crisis is something that I imagine a lot of people struggle with, especially if you can get a job and you can just sort of jump back into life, but you feel a little bit like a fraud. Because while I was um, at Manhattanville College and living in the dorm and had a, a wonderful experience and met some wonderful people. I wasn't a college kid. I was a survivor of trauma, mm. of abuse, of isolated confinement, of somebody who had seen horrible things happen in prison and people be uh, hurt. And um, I was not really, you know, almost like coming back from a war, right? You're just mm -hmm. not going to fit back into the community. Um, fast forward, I began to work at, I applied and worked at the Correctional Association with a wonderful team, Bob Ganji, the ED back then, and Tamar Kraft Stoller. And I suddenly realized they had sent me a DVD that had on it um, women going to Albany to advocate for criminal justice issues. And it was like my world had opened. Mm. And I suddenly realized my calling. I realized that not only could I use my experience and all of this pain, but I could impact others. Mm -hmm. And that for me was a turning point. That was where I found my freedom for real mm -hmm. on the outside. And we mobilized hundreds of women to advocate and families. And the more I started talking to people, the more I realized everybody had somebody they knew who had been in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and still. And still does. So, you know, especially on Long Island, people like to hide things. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know that you're Any, neighbor... anywhere, not just anywhere. Long Island. <laughs> no, but that's but it's really interesting. When I first read about you and then contacted you, what I thought was, you know, most people think around the country think that Long Island is a, a very homogenous world of affluence, and the fact that you're Latina, you've uh, um, been to prison, you're a woman who's in leadership. No, not the stereotypical view of what a Long Islander is. That's right. And I think the uh, stereotypical view of Long Island is hopefully going to change because we are, unfortunately, very racially segregated. Um, we have huge pockets of poverty and you cross over one highway and you go from Hempstead where there's huge poverty to Garden City where there's huge wealth and mm -hmm. old, old wealth. Yeah. And one of the things on Long Island that um, I'm hoping to really change and affect, uh, having worked in New York City for years and then come back to Long Island to raise my my son and my I have my family, I suddenly realized that we need to do something and call out those who are overtly racist and biased against um, those who've been incarcerated. You know, out on Long Island, 
we still haven't passed fair hiring practices in Suffolk County. Mm. It's passed in New York City in 2015. And in Suffolk County, there is still really a divide um, about why we should help people who've been incarcerated mm. and how they can give back. And hopefully New Hour is showing our community that not only do women come home, but that they don't return to prison. That, you know, if you've, especially women who've committed violent crimes, they don't return to prison. They, they do their time. They come home and they, they start fresh. Um, and a lot of times it is linked to, as you said, Bev's to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that um, hopefully we're going to start to see a shift, mm -hmm. especially because there is such broad spread uh, bipartisan support for criminal justice reform throughout the nation. Well, because it's expensive to keep warehousing people. And, you know, one of the expensive parts, is, you know, are taxes. Yes. People don't want to think about mm -hmm. safety and taxes in the same sentence when it comes to, okay, well, we don't want bail reform. We don't want people who are poor to be able to, you know, afford their bail. But we, we you know, we want people to stay in jail because they're safe there. They're not going to hurt us. Well, the truth is that most people, most, are not dangerous and they do deserve to be out on bail and it's saving money. You know, the prison industrial complex, as we know, is expensive. It is. Very. And that's why you're start. that's why, you know, a lot of these states are having these big conversations around, you know, how do we close prisons? What are the alternatives to incarceration? Like, how do we alleviate this tax burden? Because they're, you know, we, we sprung up all these prisons, for-profit prisons, state prisons, all kinds of prisons. And now we can't afford them. We can't afford them. And the, the other piece of that is that often, you know, while, while we run a program in the jail and, and we are very grateful for a sheriff who is supportive and, and really a visionary in terms of thinking about programming and rehabilitation. Most sheriffs aren't thinking that way. Um, uh, you know, maybe some are. Most prisons are not invested in rehabilitation as much as incarceration and just keeping you there till you've done your time. I have women that call us from the state facilities. I'm coming home in a month. I'm coming back to Long Island. I have no plans. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where I'm going to live. I, you know, that kind of reentry processing should be happening from day one in the prisons. Yes. And the truth is, every prison and jail, they're their own fiefdom. They run according to their own sheriff or superintendent. There's no uh, mandatory minimum in terms of how things should be run or account, mm -hmm. you know, and a level of accountability. I mean, there are folks who say they have accountability for those things, but we see that prisons create trauma. Yep. And yep. that creates, uh, you know, unsafety in our community mm -hmm. when folks come home and they're desperate they don't know where they're going to live yes how, how how much of a problem or maybe advantage is it that um that you're headquartered in suffolk but that's like so far away from where the conversation is happening in albany or even in new york city people don't realize how many people are on long island there's there in nassau and suffolk county there's as many people as there are in the whole, the whole state of connecticut mm. yeah. and and yet it's very hard to get to and maybe divorce from the mainstream conversation. So what, what happens with that? That's, that's a great question because um, Long Island is bigger than 30 states or 33 <laughs> states, the population. <laughs> and not, wow. even, the population. Not, even, not even the New York City parts of Long right. Island, just Nassau right. and Suffolk. And it's, you know, that's news bigger. to me. I did not know that. Yes, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people living there. Mm -hmm. And the other piece that I think is important to highlight is at the state level, uh, many advocates and organizations are realizing that Long Island senators actually vote as a block often, and those mm. six senators can dictate quite a bit of the New York state politics. Mm. So um, it is very interesting to think about how Long Island plays into uh, this role. And really, how do we take full advantage of this role mm -hmm. because um i think long islanders don't understand their power mm, yeah so is that so 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 is your advocacy focused more or less on the legislative body like do you do your best to get to that block to sort of yes. say listen see us and yes this is our concern yes and i think one of the things that we've been really focusing on is voting rights and voter enfranchisement because People who come home from prison and jail often don't realize how powerful their voice can be and how important it is, if they can vote, mm -hmm. uh, that they should. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, we saw this with Lester Holt holding, um, you know, conversations with lawmakers and uh, inside Angola prison. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is the right time. This is the time to say to our state senators, where do you stand on voting rights for prisoners? Where do you stand on domestic violence and women who've served time? Where do you stand on your aging population of prisoners and their ability to be seen by a parole board, even if they have a life sentence? These are questions they've never been asked before. You know, we sat down with some of our senators um, on Long Island, and honestly, many of them are interested but have not heard these questions before, and they should be hearing them. Wow. This should be part of that vetting process for every candidate. And I, I would hope that we're moving towards candidates who understand that the criminal justice uh, community can have an impact on state law mm-hmm. and that we should mm-hmm. and that they should be thinking about how their role in this work is um, going to change lives because so many, you know, on Long Island, we have a heroin epidemic. We have a sex trafficking, human trafficking epidemic. Uh, one in 10 women in our jail have said that they have survived uh, human trafficking mm-hmm. and many to, um, to support opioid addiction. And gangs on Long Island, people don't know about MS-13. Well, it's, it's, it's been in the paper a lot lately. Yes. But Long Island has pockets that are, that are gang territory. Yes, there are, there are a lot of issues. Um, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, when people hear, you know, President Trump talking about coming to where we work in Brentwood because he's saying it's gang involved. We would argue against that. You know, we live in the community. And um, while MS-13 is a problem, it is not just our problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's um, a quick and easy way to label folks, especially kids. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've had this conversation uh, over the years when I, you know, when I served as a city legislator and and the the banding about the word of gangs yes you know like yes. th- there's some specific language that speaks to what a gang is and sometimes people just sort of arbitrarily slap that on a Absolutely. group of kids and then everybody's like oh i see a, i see a gang of kids and then they automatically yeah. think some organized crime kind of thing is happening and yeah and we see it a lot on long island um you know we talk all the time if you're a person of color and you're in the community and you're standing next to a certain area, you are, you know, you're, you're deemed guilty before you've done anything and you maybe are not doing anything. Mm-hmm. And so um, we would love to see our police department uh, have have more education about how they how they profile. And um, I think racism and bias on Long Island is is a big issue, mm-hmm. the big, big issue. And folks are completely segregated. They just had an, a housing expo- expose about what the realtors are still doing. They did this to my grandparents who moved from Puerto Rico to the Bronx to Long Island. And they said, oh, you want a house in Brentwood, not in Smithtown. Well, the houses in Smithtown now are million dollar houses or 700,000 and up and, uh, you know, accruing this this great, you know, financial gain and yet, you know, they had accents. And so they were pushed into a certain area. Uh-huh. That redlining. And yeah. that redlining happens. And it's and it's still crazy happening. that it's still happening. Yeah, still mm-hmm. happening for sure. Yes. So tell me a little bit. Tell us a little bit about uh, what New Hour does. Yes. What are you charged with doing? So New Hour is really, it's a, it's a great story. Um, there is a wonderful couple, George and Patty Kraus, and they live on the east end of Long Island. And um, every year for their daughter's birthday, they do something wonderful. And one year she said, Dad, you know, I'm turning 35. I want to do something to give back. And she did some research and found an organization called Our Children, which is in Queens, which does a very similar model to ours. In fact, we piloted our model after theirs. Mm -hmm. Um, Her dad said, well, that sounds great. But, and you know, they talked and they said, but what's on Long Island? Is there anything on Long Island that works with women who've been incarcerated? Mm. Well, there was nothing. There was not one nonprofit that sole mission was dedicated to supporting women and children. What year was this? 2014. Wow. Yes. And there were women that were going to prison from Long Island, right? Oh, yes. Okay. And so Sister Tisa Fitzgerald, who's the wonderful executive director, you know, sister. We love her. Yep. Yep. 
Well, sister and I knew each other very, very well. And she called me and she said, would you meet with this man? He is interested in supporting something. Mm -hmm. And so I met with him and he asked me about my story and what led me to prison and told him about family violence and, uh, you know, mental illness in my family and the tragedies that took place and how I had been working hard to kind of recover my life and help others. And he said, do me a favor. Would you write up a plan? Would you create a vision for what you could imagine Long Island to having? And I was blown away. I created what was our blueprint for this organization. And I put in it everything that I didn't get when I mm. was incarcerated and when I came home. Mm -hmm. So we do direct service in the jails, parenting program, reentry training, discharge planning, uh, health and wellness, women's support. And then we also included for their children and their families, a support group, a leadership and training institute that runs twice a year with 15 women, a session where we bring in speakers, we bring in resources. And that model was really modeled after uh, the work I did at the Correctional Association's Women in Prison Project. They had a trauma-informed leadership program. And the whole point of that program was then to make sure that women give back, mm -hmm. that they understand what are the underlying issues that cause women to become incarcerated. You know, so many women come into our program and they're beaten down by life and by their experiences, by their abuser, by prison, by jail. And they say, I just want my kids back. I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I just want a safe house. Where do I start? Um, I don't have a job and I need employment. So women come to us with their specific needs. They meet with our social worker, meet with, with our program director. But most of all, it's a safe space where there's a sense of community. Mm -hmm. They don't have and haven't had a space where you can say, I was in prison or jail and that means something. And now I need support and I want to give back. And so uh, we had a young woman come in with her mother and her mother said, you know, she's out, she's here, she's, she's doing okay, but she has no support. So we have monthly support group meetings and we have uh, re-entry I think bags. that's so critical because I, I see, when, you know, when I came out from federal time and I, I remember coming back into the community and there was no place that I could go to like share with people who had just come through what I come through. Yes. Right. Like this is just not conversation you could have at a cocktail party. No. Right. Like, cause everybody gets all freaked out when you say, Oh, you know, I served a little time or whatever. Yes. So I understand that when there's no place for women to talk about, you know, because when you get out, what do they tell you? You got to find housing. If you want your kids back, you got to go do this. You may have a probation officer yeah. or a parole officer who is like janky. So you got to deal with that hoops and then they want you to show up to parole and they never show up to, you never get to show up in times that's conducive with work. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. And you have to find transportation, so you have to, find transportation to get there. And, and that could take two or three. You, you got to pay, pay for that. And no, God knows how long you're going to be yeah. there. So. I mean, I remember sitting in parole waiting to be seen. I was one of two women in the whole building filled with men. I was a young woman. I was 21 and it was intimidating mm -hmm. and you don't know who to talk to, who to trust. Uh, and your parole officer doesn't give you guidance or support. You know, ha n we often say naming something right is, is really helping you to take away the power that that has over your life, whether sure. it be substance abuse mm -hmm. or any abuse saying that you've been incarcerated and being able to say that in a space and not be judged and to say, Oh, I identify with you. I know what you've been through is so valuable in the healing process mm -hmm. for women. And that's that's what New Hour affords. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a real cultural difference between women being accepted back into families and they've handed off their children to relatives and maybe even the uh, children are be are identified as victims, for example, so right. that so that they can't um, they can't reconnect with them or they can't live with them without. Yes. Their, um, um, jumping over some hurdles. Yes, yes. And many women often say they've been charged with endangering the welfare of a child, which sounds very scary, child mm. neglect. And, and, and it may not have been that there was an altercation against the child. The child was just there yeah. when there was yep. drugs in the house. And, you know, we don't make excuses for women or their behavior, but we say to our women all the time, if you... You, you will always be your child's mother, whether they take away your rights or not. We will help you fight to keep those rights if you mm. are doing the right thing and want to be in your child's life. The interesting thing about K-12 
kids, right, is that they love you no matter what. They do. They are unconditionally, they love their parents and they want their parents in their lives. And I think people often, especially the court system, you know, they move to terminate parental rights for, for moms and for fathers. But really, the primary caretaker often is the mother. Three quarters of our women are moms. And they don't realize that you can't decide that someone is not your child. Your child is never going to say that's not their biological parent, whether you terminate rights or not. And so there's a lot of healing that has to happen in the system mm. to help help mend families who've been impacted. And, and incarceration, as we know, doesn't do a whole lot to mend. You know? No. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how, how are you funded? I mean, the... Uh, in, in your bio here, fundraising comes up pretty fast. <laughs> so how, how are you funded? And is there a difference between funding for programs and funding for advocacy, for yes, example? Yes, yes. There is absolutely a difference. You know what's interesting? We've had funders like uh, we just recently, we have private funders, we have fundraisers, we have our major donors, Patty and George Krause, who are incredibly wonderful to us and committed to us over this uh, course of the beginning of our work. Mm -hmm. um, but we interestingly just got um, a little bit of money from Capital One, and we're seeing, you know, JP Morgan is announcing this, right? Uh, the banks are talking about giving back, certainly they should. And one of the interesting things that Capital One's program folks said to me was, what we, the reason that we decided to fund you versus somebody else is because you're not just doing direct service, you're not just doing advocacy, you're actually informing your advocacy with those you've done direct service with. Mm -hmm. And that's really the sweet spot in terms of where I see the work going. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's okay to hand out that turkey on Thanksgiving and it's okay to give like we give reentry bags full, filled with a weekend full of materials and support for women coming home from jail. But if that's all you do, you've missed the mark. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, women coming home have so much potential and men to give back, to be empowered. You know, we were in Albany and so many of our women who were there were saying how it feels so good to be a productive member of the community, mm -hmm. to give back and to say, here's what has to change about the system. You know, um, many years ago, Eddie Ellis was talking about this. Uh, you know, my, my friend Glenn, we were all talking about um, directly impacted people are the folks that can most best change the system. Mm -hmm. That's we it. We know it inside The people out. closest to the problem Absolutely. are closest to, to the, the solution. solution. Glenn's Absolutely. been here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So um, when you go up to Albany, um, you find that the legislators are interested in stories. They're interested in the actual impact of the justice system on people who are affected? Yeah. One of the things I realized very quickly, and this was back when I was working at the Correctional Association, if you don't have a uh, moving narrative, if you don't have a memorable story that can help a legislator see a situation as a person, you know, humanizing it mm -hmm. is so important. And what I realized were um, a lot of the women we worked with um, had never told their story before and were nervous and maybe didn't know how to explain things and maybe hadn't even internalized and thought about how they were involved in their crime or what were the things that led them down that pathway and how do they explain that? Mm -hmm. And so my work with her story, we began to help explore how women and men can tell their stories about the impact of their lives and do it for a, a purpose for mm -hmm. to help others change and um, I always say that, you know, you can you can talk stats, you can talk facts, but the one thing you'll remember is my story. Yes. You're going to remember the, the, the pieces of somebody's life experience versus anything else. And so if we want lawmakers to really affect change for those of us who've been incarcerated in our families, we need to be honest and vocal and vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? Like, so it's not easy to tell your story, I but agree. it's so important. Mm -hmm. So as we wind down, we got a few seconds, a few minutes left. Uh, what are you most hopeful about as you do this work? I find it so rewarding to see women come into my office and get what I didn't get, mm -hmm. which was an open arm, a warm handshake, uh, a bag of supplies, a space to identify as somebody who is a survivor of incarceration. You know, we always say formerly incarcerated, right? Returning citizens. But I say survivor, mm. because if you've 
been to prison, you know you've survived something. <laughs> and, and, and it doesn't matter how long you've gone. If you spent 20 minutes, you've survived you've it. You've survived it. So, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Yeah, and the, and the years leading up to and the years coming home from, I mean, it's an ordeal. People, yeah. people It doesn't end when you walk out pe- that door. People don't know. Every, every sentence is a life sentence. Yes. Every sentence is a life sentence. That's so important because... You know, in the work I've done over the last 20 years, it takes so long to identify, move on, and you, you don't, you never fully move on, right? If you hear certain things, they can trigger. You hear keys sound a certain way, you remember officer's keys. You smell certain <laughs> soap, and you remember the state soap. I mean, we're laughing, but these are things no, that, that I mean, you know, right? Like, listen, these are traumatizing things I, that I know are exactly. triggering. We're laughing I know with exactly. I, <laughs> laughing with identification. Identification. Yes, yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Identification. Yeah. You, mean, you know, you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you, you're like, okay, where am I? Where am I? Am I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. And, so. and I think that while the the move towards ending mass incarceration is is so important. I think we still have so far to go to understand the victimization of women. You know, I still feel there are there is no good reason a mother should be incarcerated. That she should be in rehab or in treatment in a facility where her child can be with her. You know, you're destroying children's lives when you have their primary caretaker not with them. And I think if there's, um, I'd love to see in the next you know, 25 years, a different model, a completely different model than the one we have to, to, to a, a restorative justice model, right? Mm-hmm. We talk mm-hmm. about this a lot. Instead of just uh, incarcerate, throw away the key, victimize, abuse, and throw them back to the street to start over. Yes. Thank you so much, Serena Ligori. Yeah, be, Thank uh, you. Before we get off, um, we want to uh, get your contact information out there. And here in Connecticut and Suffolk County, we get each other's radio stations. Yes, and, yes. And we're live streaming and there's podcasting as well. So a lot of people will be able to hear this. So why don't, why don't you, uh, you know, p- pitch your fundraising and tell everyone how to yeah. uh, contact you. If you'd like to give, if you'd like to fund work with our moms and kids and women, or you'd like to volunteer, you'd like to intern, come and visit our office. We're at 1725 Brentwood Road, Brentwood, New York, 11717. You can visit our website, www.newhournewhourli.org. Uh, and you can also email. Email us at contact us at newhourli.org. And um, we are really grateful because we've had such a groundswell of support in the community. They've said, oh, I, I never knew this was out there. Mm. Oh, I've wanted to work with women in prison before. I'm a social worker or I've survived uh, substance abuse or uh, domestic violence, and I'd love to give back. So um, thank you for helping us share a little bit about our work. It's been we, our pleasure to have yeah. you on. Yeah. We're very excited as we as we branching out farther and farther from Connecticut that you're our Long Island representative yes, now. Absolutely. Was Boomer Esiason from Brentwood? Is, what's that? Remember the football player? Is he from there? I don't know. I, Maybe. I don't know. I don't know football. We, we got to get some Brentwood <laughs> people to support you. Yes, yes. I would I would love to have uh, some support on Long Island. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being thank our guest you. today. And I hope Pleasure. you come back. Absolutely. I would love thank to. You, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. another a great, great show. Thank you to the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. Now more than ever. Travel safely, Andrew. And how? And 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 on your ferry ride. I will be back. on the ferry ride. And, your ferry ride. <laughs> and yes. thank you, Lynn, for supporting us too. Okay. And uh, love you, Babs. Love you too, Jeff Grant. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian Slattery. <laughs>
Thank you. 